So today I will talk about uh, the momentum in stochastic gradient descent and uh, neural architecture design. So momentum, this uh, is uh, like a very basic and fundamental techniques for accelerated gradient descent. And uh, in gradient descent, it has been well understood. However, in stochastic gradient descent, it seems uh, still not fully understand yet. Uh, we do not fully understand this yet. Also, we will talk about how can we use this momentum idea to develop uh, new neural architectures. This, uh, I would say this is, uh, again, a mathematically principled approach. Okay. So this is a joint work with uh, collaborators at uh, Rice University and also my personal mentor, in particular, Professor Stan Osher. He provided lots of uh, crucial ideas here. <coughs> so. Again, this, uh, today people talk about deep learning and uh, develop uh, deep learning algorithms and also apply deep learning to different domains, in particular like uh, medical imaging as uh, the main theme of today's workshop. Okay. So to my understanding of deep learning is uh, essentially uh, contains four parts. First is the big data acqu acquisition techniques and then deep neural nets and the stochastic gradient descent and high performance computing. From the mathematical algorithmic viewpoint, uh, deep neural nets and stochastic gradient descent has been existing for, for more than half a century. So uh, we are still uh, lots of new things uh, uh, co coming in these two areas. Big data acquisition and high performance computing, this uh, like uh, still relatively sh short history. Like uh, perhaps in the past 10 years, uh, there are lots of uh, big data acquisition, high quality big data acquisition techniques like uh, crowdsourcing, this is uh, widely used. But uh, for our mathematicians, it's uh, a little bit harder to do things in this way. Also, high performance computing, this is more or less like uh, the hardware. So then we are focusing on neural nets design and uh, stochastic gradient descent. Now let me explain what is uh, deep learning in the context of uh, image classification. I think uh, many of you know this. Uh, for instance, uh, for a given handwritten digits, we want to train a neural network to classify it. Okay. Then first, uh, for the in training, in training procedure, first we feed this uh, image into the multi-layer convolutional filters. And then th through this convolutional transformation, this we learn a Deep representation. Finally, fit this deep representation into the uh, softmax classifier or the multi class logic regression classifier to get the prediction. And then this prediction may not be the same as the ground truth label. And then we define a loss function between this ground truth and the prediction, try to backprop the loss to update the parameters. Okay. So this simple Conceptually simple framework uh, revolutionizes uh, both the science and technology. For instance, uh, in technology, this is a uh, made a tremendous impact. In 2017, like uh, Apple, the in their face recognition system, Face ID, they integrated deep neural nets for real-time face. Uh, uh, face recognition. Also, today's uh, industry, people uh, talk a uh, like uh, many people invest a lot in this uh, autonomous driving, in particular like <coughs> Tesla, Google. Uh, uh, one of the main techniques of uh, autonomous driving car is uh, leveraging uh, deep neural nets for real-time object detection and uh, classification. Also, in 2015, those. Uh, uh, the first time, like uh, people trust this artificial intelligence, uh, those uh, machine intelligence beats uh, human intelligence in playing this uh, alpha, playing this goal. This goal game is uh, quite uh, difficult. This uh, contains too many possible states. Okay, so it's uh, impossible to do exhaustive search. So we have to develop deep learning approaches. Also, like uh, Google uses uh, neural nets to do this uh, machine translation. Even though those, their neural nets is quite big, but they can translated between multiple languages uh, very accurately. This is a revolution in science. Also in, uh, in, uh, in technology, also in science, deep learning made tremendous impact. For instance, in uh, 2018, at the end of 2018, Google DeepMind, they used uh, deep learning for protein structure prediction, which won the first, won the first prize in CASP computation. Protein structure prediction, this is a, a 3D protein structure, secondary structure. Uh, the, the task is I give you amino acid sequence, and then I want to predict this 3D structure. 
Okay, so this is a very difficult task since this is a highly long convex problem. Uh, each amino acid we know is a 3D structure, but as they get together, this structure will be quite difficult. Okay. Also in, in pharmaceutical industry, people leverage deep learning for the so virtual screening, which save a large amount of effort in, in preclinical and clinical testing. So this is uh, related to, uh, to medicine. Okay. Also, for, to develop these drugs, drug molecules, the like chemists use deep learning to do this, uh, also molecule generations. Because some, some chemists, they have a good intuition to design what, what's the structure of this molecule, but uh, many of them may not have such a good intuition, then they leverage this uh, machine intelligence to develop this. Also, chem uh, material scientists use deep learning to develop, uh, uh, like, uh, to design different materials. Okay. These are the, uh, the good part of uh, uh, deep learning, where well, there are still lots of uh, lot of good parts. But uh, I am focusing on the mathematical part of this. So as we said, there are basically two interesting parts to me. First is to uh, develop a better SGD algorithm to train this um, neural network. Second is uh, to develop a better neural architectures. Okay. So today, basically, I will talk about these two things. First uh, is uh, momentum in SGD. So then we consider whether momentum in SGD can accelerate the convergence or not. Second is whether this uh, momentum in SGD can improve generalization or not. Okay. Because when we train a machine learning model, we want uh, it to be cheap to train. Also, this, uh, the model will be more accurate. These are two of the, uh, two of the most important tasks. Also, in neural architecture design, also we want to, first we have, need to have a principled approach instead of ad hoc approach. Right? So also we want the design neural network to be easier to train and also generalize better. Okay? So these are uh, some of uh, just the outline of my talk today. First, uh, we look at the momentum in optimization. Uh, in, com in deterministic case, uh, momentum today, as we said, uh, is already well understood. Uh, Let's consider general machine learning, how machine learning uh, problem is formulated. Suppose we have a machine learning model, y equal to gxw. This w is the parameter of the machine learning model, like a neural network. Okay. We generally see this is a function. And given input data, it will give us the prediction. Then, uh, this W lies in a very high dimensional space. So for instance, this W dimension can be 10 to 10, like a Google translation neural network. I look at uh, the latest report contains 80 billion parameters, so this is uh, at 10 to 10. Then classical numerical, numerical methods may not be very, may not be scalable to this scale. We have to, to develop better algorithms. Second, uh, when we train machine learning model, typically we give a lot of training data, x, i, y, i. And this training data, the number of training data also scales to, to billion level. Like uh, when we train uh, translation, um, uh, like uh, machine translation, we contain a lot of data. This data uh, con at this level, like uh, one billion record. Okay, so then we we'll formulate this empirical risk on this training data. Next, uh, for for instance, this empirical risk we can choose as uh, the Cross entropy loss. Okay, this cross entropy loss, which is for classification, so based on the prediction and ground truth, we can uh, how to quantify the difference. Then back up this loss to get the, uh, the get the trend model. Okay, so this is how machine learning model is formulated. Then let's just consider. How can we solve this optimization problem? First, we do not consider the difficult part. Let's just consider a toy case. Let's see, this is convex, like a logic regression. Convex, also this is smooth, but not a strong convex. Okay. Just a convex and a smooth function. Then, uh, the simplest approach back to Koch in, uh, in, uh, in 1847, and then they have, uh, he developed uh, this uh, gradient descent. Then starting from a point, and then do this uh, compute the gradient, and then along the gradient direction go one step. Okay, so then this scheme is extremely simple, and the the convergence rate is one over k, one over k convergence. This is actually looks not very good, but actually this is a decent result because this the convergence is independent of the dimension of the problem. Uh, for instance, previously we said the dimension can be 10 to 10, okay. but this, this one doesn't depend on that. It's not like the simulated and linearly, those uh, type of algor evolution algorithm is dimension dependent. Okay. 
Let's look at a, a simple example, convex function. We just uh, consider this uh, quadratic function. This uh, function, like uh, the, this part, the quadratic part is uh, just a graph Laplace, okay, uh, which is one thousand dimensional problem. And B is a vector, just uh, the first entry is one, all the other entries are zero. Then we apply gradient descent, let's see what will happen. <laughs> gradient descent, okay, then converge initially, it's good, but uh, finally it's very slow. If we want the accurate, uh, the tolerance, uh, let's say t 10 to minus 10, then perhaps we need to, to wait for a few years in order to get it to 10 to 10, right? So it's uh, impossible to do that. Then we have to consider if we can accelerate this or not. Then Newton, they have the method called Newton's method, right? Just uh, com compute the inverse of the Hessian to multiply, multiply the gradient with the inverse of Hessian. Then this uh, converges much, much faster. But as we said, in modern machine learning, this dimension is so high, like 10 to 10, this level. So the you know, inverse of a matrix is impossible. Or you might say cosine Newton. But cosine Newton, still I need to do matrix vector multiplication. It's still very expensive. Right? <laughs> then a better idea is just leverage the historic information. Right? Because when I do gradient descent, not only I have the current step information, I also have previous step information. I just need, uh, leverage one step information. Then and every time I then leverage this information to do one step extrapolation. Okay. This is uh, the uh, momentum, okay. momentum scheme. Then we look at the convergence, momentum much faster, but a lot, lot much better, a lot of significantly better. And the threatening the convergence rate is still one over k. Okay. It's still one over k. But this uh, certainly much better, right? Uh, but if we want to get a 10 to 10, perhaps we still need to, to wait for a few years. Okay. <coughs> Well, also, for the momentum, we have the heavy ball method, which essentially is the same. Just so we, uh, to get the current step, we need a previous step and the, the step before the previous step. Okay, just the three steps. If we look at the continuous version, actually this is uh, ODE, okay, second order ODE. And then this second order it, ODE, I think, uh, the, it's uh, well damped. So then this is a monotonic. Okay. This is uh, due to uh, Pontiac. In 1964, okay, like uh, 60, around 60 years ago. Then we need to understand why momentum works so well. Let's look at one simple example. This is just a gradient descent. For this, I think this type of problem is, uh, appears frequently in modern machine learning. Right? This uh, condition is not well conditioned. Then gradient descent is initially highly oscillated, and finally like, uh, oscillated even more. So it's very slow. But if we do momentum, okay, do momentum, then because of we have the previous uh, information in the previous step, then we do just do some actual actualization. Then this is converge much faster. You see, this is optimal, and uh, with the same number of iterations, this one is still here, and this one already uh, reach the global uh, reach the global optimal. Okay, so this is uh, why momentum works so well. When, yes. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah, yes. Or it doesn't matter. Uh, for for this, uh, uh, yes. So sometimes we have to tune the momentum parameters. Uh, depend on the problem. If the problem is uh, very difficult, then to tune the parameters is very difficult. Okay. Uh, but uh, I think this is uh, durable because uh, for this problem, if some problem you you need to wait for a few years in order to solve it, and then you use momentum significantly accelerated. Right? And uh, then this is a momentum, but uh, still, as we said, all heavy ball methods, still one over k convergence, doesn't help too much. In deep learning, actually, people propose this called something called look ahead. Okay, look ahead. Look ahead is a variant of the momentum I just mentioned. This is uh, the first, uh, I think, a seminar work was by Sukhasev. He is, I think, a pioneer. I guess uh, I think he's the first guy who makes deep learning works in image classification. He was a student of uh, Jeffrey Hinton. He's a uh, really uh, uh, like a fantastic guy. So then they basically every step instead to compute the I would say this is a relate to the momentum. Then they do one step look ahead. Just when they compute gradient, not exactly as this step. They use the previous information to compute the gradient. Okay, to compute the gradient and then do the update. This one is widely used in deep learning. Deep learning actually just use this gradient instead, uh, just use the stochastic gradient of this, fo uh, this form. And then also, in today's deep learning, like uh, 
platform, for instance, the PyTorch, they use this one. Actually, this one and this one are almost the same, except they make the step size to here. Okay. These three schemes, together with the momentum scheme I showed before, are almost the same. Okay. Convergence, everything is the same. But this one, in practice, uh, is slightly better because we have this look ahead part. Well, everything so far is just a 1 over k convergence. Okay. 1 over k. <coughs> 1 over k is certainly extremely slow. It's not something we want. Then, one of the big breakthroughs due to uh, Lestrop, uh, I forgot to cite the papers here, it was in 1985. They proposed the uh, 1 over k square convergence scheme. Okay. 1 over k square. <coughs> the only change is uh, instead of using a constant momentum, we make this momentum to depend on, to be depend on the, the uh, current iteration. Okay. Depend on the iteration. Like uh, we make this k minus 1 divided by k plus 2, this, uh, this term. And then this geometry uh, makes this much, much faster. To reach to 10 to minus 10, this is actually only uh, 50,000 iteration. Actually, we have an even better approach to make this converge just in less than 1,000 iterations. But uh, this is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, really a revolution in this uh, uh, first order optimization. And first order optimization is really useful in data science because consider the dimension, 10 to 10. Okay, okay this is a good, uh, good uh, scheme. Then, if we look at the trajectory, right, this one is a lot monotonic. This actually oscillates a lot. If something oscillates a lot, then we have to think about, is there any way to further accelerate this? Right. For instance, if we are at this, at here, for instance, we do, we do restart. Let's say we reset k equal to 1. Reset k equal to 1. Then, because when k equal to 1, then this part is reduced to gradient descent. Gradient descent is guaranteed to be monotonic. Right. So then this, will, this can be further accelerated. So we just do some restart. For instance, here we set this to t. We t increase by one if the objective function if f f w decays. Otherwise, we set t equal to one. This is called adaptive restart. For the adaptive restart, do we really have a theoretical guarantee? This is much faster. We have, but uh, this is not free. We need to make some actual assumption, sharpness assumption. Sharpness assumption is just locally, if we x, uh, along x direction, we change a little bit, then this, the function value has to change or not, to change it by a certain amount. If something just flat, then this is not sharp. Right? So under this sharpness assumption, we can prove the convergence rate is uh, e to, is linear convergent. Okay. Linear convergent to e to, to this, uh, let's say 10 to 10, perhaps just, uh, uh, this I would say 5,000 iterations. So this is much faster. Yes. What happens under sharpness <laughs> assumptions for the normal gradient descent? Uh, for normal gradient descent, uh, still uh, one over k. Even with sharpness. Yes, with sharp, still one over k. In order to be better than one over k, we have to make the strong, strong convex assumption. Yeah. Strong convex makes the function almost the quadratic function. Okay. So, but as for general function, then this uh, uh, is still one over k. With this sharpness uh, uh, assumption, then also restart it together with less of accelerated gradient, this scheme, then we can prove linear convergence. Is this a necessary and sufficient condition, or is it just sufficient? A sufficient condition, that's why I'm not sure. This is a, a work by some French in a paper published in LIPS 2017. Yeah. I think this paper is highly underrated. Man, many people did not realize this paper. Okay. Well, <coughs> This is adaptive restart. But adaptive restart, a big problem is uh, this may not be useful for deep learning, right? Because we, our, we have too many data points, right? So to compute the objective value is difficult. Then how about we do schedule restart? Just we set some, some points, some anchors. Once we reach that iteration, we reset, the, we reset this momentum, right? Just set within some iterations, increase by one. Otherwise, just reset t equal to one. Then this is just like we schedule something. Once we reach that schedule, then we restart. Okay. This one will be much more practical. Right? Just, then essentially, we just has, we have a few parameters, like uh, perhaps two parameters, set to scheduling. Then this uh, still is proven to, to be linear convergent. 
with uh, still actual sharpness assumption. Yes. Very quick question. So is, is it easy to verify sharpness assumptions for neural nets? Yes, sharpness is easy to verify. Okay. Yes. Uh, but this is still for convex uh, problem. If long, uh, if long convex, then there is no such a uh, decent uh, guarantee. Okay. But by itself, it's easy. <laughs> yes, yes. Because n I don't think uh, something will be flat, you know. Some, if something is flat, then everything is local minimal. And uh, also, if something is flat, then you cannot use gradient descent, since you will always stay there. Right? Yeah? Look at this performance. This is uh, gradient descent. This is uh, gradient descent with the momentum, like a heavy ball method. And then this is less of eccentric gradient, much better. Then if we do adaptive restart, adaptive restart is this, uh, this red one. Right? Adaptive restart is linear conversion. If we do a scheduled restart appropriately, still achieve linear convergence. Yeah. Then, <coughs> okay, then we have to ask a qu uh, question. How about whether this is still true in, in stochastic gradient descent? Because today we are doing machine learning. In particular, we are doing deep learning. Right? If we still have such a decent result, then everything will be good. Then perhaps we cannot do much thing. But uh, there is an interesting thing about this. In machine learning, since this n is quite big, we have to do uh, this uh, mini batch approximation to compute this uh, stochastic gradient. Stochastic gradient. So the question we want to ask is, uh, can that sort of accelerated gradient still accelerate the convergence of stochastic gradient? Okay. The answer is uh, no. Okay. Again, let's uh, first look at uh, one simple example. Look back into our previous quadratic function. Okay. For this quadratic function, we we just add some s very small noise. Add some very small noise to the to the problem. Okay, then that we see that the, this noise, the variance is decays because the training machine learning model as uh, because our typically we make the step size decays, right? So then the variance also decays. We try to simulate this. Then we use a different scheme. Okay, we use different scheme. In this case, we see that the gradient descent and the and the uh, adaptive restart lecture of scheme, both uh, like still decay almost monotonically. But uh, this lecture of scheme, like uh, not stable at all. If we do this uh, gradient descent with momentum, actually this is how uh, really people use in deep learning. This one is very good, right? This uh, beats the previous three schemes. Okay. That's why if we look at uh, today's deep learning, we typically set uh, the momentum parameter to, let's say, point line. And also we have another choice is whether we use less of or not, right? Because this, you see, this already very, performs very well. But if we do schedule restart, we can be much better. Okay. This is uh, ignored in this uh, machine learning community, schedule restart. But people actually, they are smart. They realize that this, just a stochastic gradient with momentum performs very well. They did not study the density of accelerated gradient. Okay. Now, how about we, we make the noise much bigger, not as time dependent. We just uh, use a constant, uh, constant noise, okay. still for this uh, quadratic function. Then we look at this, okay, the very bad. This lecture of accelerated gradient does not even converge. Okay. This is a very deep result. For, thi for this case, the lecture of scheme, like uh, this constant noise, like in this case, we add a constant noise. Constant noise is, for instance, when we do those uh, privacy preserving machine learning, we add a constant noise to, to guarantee the differential privacy. That's why nobody uses this lecture of eccentric gradient to train machine learning model with privacy guarantee, since this will not converge at all. Okay. Well, these are toy cases. So that we look at uh, Another realistic case, do a logic regression for MLISA classification. We see that, uh, okay, very bad. This uh, that's true of accelerated gradient. That's true of accelerated stochastic gradient, like diverges, okay. just in terms of such a simple model. Then, now, so far, perhaps we should uh, get this take home message is that uh, the schedule restart might still be able to accelerate the stochastic gradient descent. Right. Then we leverage this to train. You wanna, before that, we have this theoretical result. This is not, a, not our result. This uh, people, Dastrov and his student proved this. Just uh, when, when we do not have exact gradient, the gradient is uh, corrupted with some noise. For, then, for this case, we have to first uh, describe what is the inexact gradient, the inexact gradient. For exact gradient, if the function is convex and uh, smooth, we have this uh, lower bound and upper bound, right? Just uh, the, the function minus its uh, tangent line is bounded below with zero bounded above by a quadratic function. 
To accommodate the inexact gradient, we just uh, for this part, we add a small perturbation. Then Lester proved a very different result. He said, basically showed that uh, f first order, any method with, with access to the first order, first order oracle, says like this, if this convergence rate is uh, less, is just one over k, the, this, uh, this noise will not be acc accumulated. But if the convergence rate is, uh, is better than one over k, this will be accumulated. Okay. Even though this term is like, smaller than this term, but this term is much bigger. Okay. This uh, becomes a dominant term. That's why, if we look at the previous step, then you, we see that this, lo this uh, loss keeps increase. Okay. Because this, this loss is, uh, uh, this loss is accumulated during the last of accelerator gradient. Well, also, if we do adaptive restart last of because this is highly oscillatory. If highly oscillatory, when we do restart, it go back to gradient descent. So then there is no momentum at all. So it degenerates to a gradient descent. Then the best trade-off is just to do schedule restart. Okay, that's our study. So first we look at the schedule restart for training some simple neural network for CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 classification. We see that CIFAR 10 is, uh, like contains uh, 50,000 uh, small training images. Then we train this neural network, we see this, this is, uh, we are much faster. We, we do this appropriately uh, restart because neural network is long convex. Sometimes, because if this momentum is too big, then this objective value increases. This can help to avoid some bad local minima. Now in this step, perhaps this will avoid some bad local minima. And then goes goes down again. Okay. Then this improves a lot. And then we look at the accuracy. This accuracy, very interesting, is that as the neural network gets deeper, we improve much more. So for regarding improvement, we have to emphasize one thing. Is that in this in the community, lots of people find lots of uh, I would say false uh, false discovery because the people just uh, compared with the result re reported by, for instance, Kamin He before. But actually, Kamin He he used a different platform and he did not uh, fine tune enough. And today, when those uh, Google, Facebook, they reported the, the result, their baseline already much better. Then people just uh, compared with his baseline and sure we have one percent improvement. But actually, compared with baseline like uh, perhaps uh, far, uh, much worse than baseline. Then we first uh, fine tune the baseline, make the baseline the best. And then on top of this ba best baseline, we improve by this, uh, like uh, if the network gets uh, deeper enough, we improve by actually can be more than 1%. This is for CIFAR 10 and the CIFAR 100 classification. Uh, also, we want to look at an even more challenging task, like image net classification. Previously, we cannot do this, but with our collaborators, uh, we have uh, we can do these things because we have enough resource. Yes. So, Bob, so at, at epoch thirty and sixty, are you restarting or are you increasing the bandwidth? Uh, this is a uh, reduce the learning rate, but uh, here restarting, rest, we in our uh, optimization, we keep restarting. Just uh, after one hundred iterations, we restart. Okay. We do it in this way. Okay. Then for this uh, image letter classification, then again we do this resetting. Then this converges much better. Okay. And uh, if we look at the accuracy, this is even more amazing. Like uh, as the network gets deeper, the improvement gets more, okay. more and more. Especially for this 200 layer neural network, you see we get more, uh, more than one percent improvement. So this, uh, I think, for image letter, this is a very difficult task. And uh, uh, also for SGD, SGD sometimes as the network gets deeper. Then it might be harder to train very deep network, but if you use our schedule restart, then this uh, will be able to train network much better. Okay. Also, we should emphasize one thing. Uh, this is uh, like a much better illustration. You see that as the letter, uh, this uh, x axis is the number of layers, y axis is a test uh, error. Test error, you see, we are much better, and especially as the network gets deeper, we improve much more. Okay. So. One of the most uh, elegant thing about uh, this approach is, uh, on top of the existing code, we just need to change less than five lines. Okay, just less than five lines, then we can get this amount of improvement. And also, this is much more flexible. <coughs> this is the first part of my talk. So, uh, is there any qu more question? Yes. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, that depends. This, this, uh, 
Uh, you know, this momentum, for instance, if we use constant momentum, we have to tune that also. We should not use the momentum to be the point line line. This uh, might be too big. If something is too big, then this uh, may, may be very bad. You know, We have to tune this appropriately. Also, momentum, that parameter, can be hard to tune for specific problems. That's why you can do this uh, restart momentum. This restart momentum is uh, adaptive momentum. right? You start with a very small value, and then keep it increase. Keep it increase up to some threshold, you restart. Uh-huh. Uh, you will still be able to do uh, uh, these models really good? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think the Toronto group, they did a lot of work along this direction. But uh, to uh, the best of our knowledge, uh, for this restart, this is uh, much easier than their strategy. And also, uh, also you, uh, we compared with the best thing we, uh, so far. Just the best thing so far is just uh, SGD with the constant momentum and the weight decay to train Turn machine learning model for this image classification. We compare with the best model and also fine tune their model to get this result. Yeah. And then on top of that, we improve a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why I'm confident that the schedule restart is much better than aggregated momentum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, as we said, this one only need to change a few lines of code because originally people use a constant. Now you just count the iteration. And every step just set that to k minus one divided by k plus two, and then set if it reach some some threshold, you reset k equal to one. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for instance, you see convergence. This is our convergence, <coughs> right? This is twenty image net, and twenty c ten. This is also our convergence. But here we fine tune to to make the final generalization to be the best. Because then this part, this part we we guess this just escapes some better local minima. Okay, because then we get it much better. Okay, we converge much better. Also, finally, the accuracy is also much better. And a very decent thing is that as the network gets deeper, we improve more and more. Okay. We believe if if we have like see for just said uh, some like five hundred layers for image net classification, we perhaps can improve by a few percent. Okay. This thing I would say is a, is a, we get something for free, right? Change a few lines of code, and also uh, uh, right now we are also working on what is the optimal theoretical restart. Optimal theoretical restart for gradient descent is just uh, uh, proved in that uh, paper in NIPS 2017. But the optimal schedule restart for stochastic gradient, uh, nobody knows that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in case many parameters provide may provide the global minimum. Uh -huh. The important thing is that some robustness. Yes. The reason why is the dropout is there. Mm -hmm. So many different yes. parameters maybe is working well. Many yeah. different so maybe dimension is very high. Yes, yeah. That, that's the basic over parameterization. The is that somehow you get rid of the is uh, mm -hmm. very few parameters you train. Yes, yeah. And uh, because it's simultaneously trained together, <laughs> yes, yeah. then very susceptible to noise. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's a uh, that's about uh, over parameterization. Basically, people say under the over in the over parameterized regime, let's say if I have n number of uh, training data, I need to make the number of parameters to n to seven, right? That's so far the best theoretical result. But n to seven, that's uh, not practical, right? If n is like ten to ten, then you have ten to seventy. <laughs> that's the impossible thing, right? So then that's the only theoretical result. In practice, if especially also over parameterization, if you look carefully, only works for CIFAR 10. For image data, there is no over parameterization. So this I mentioned, uh, there are many, many local minimizers. Yes. That's the, not the final thing. This yes. is the aid. Yes. So you try to find a good track. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, exactly. So then, then here we have to have good, better stochastic optimization algorithm. It can help us to search for these things. Yeah, so I remember. Just one more small point. Uh. So did we give this uh, a bit more intuition? Uh -huh. Uh huh. So for, for this schedule restart, like, do you have some sort of <laughs> schedule restart is a, the idea is very simple. Just if if initially the momentum is too small, then it's not fast enough. Then we make the momentum better, adapting better. And if the momentum is too uh, too big, then this will accumulate error. Then we need to restart the momentum. Yeah. If the momentum is too big, then it's not stable. Then we restart the momentum. That's it.
Yeah. Yeah. So, so perhaps let's go to the next question because I have another part. Yeah. Uh -huh. but, but in practice, we're, we're not interested in minimizing this subscription. We're interested in minimizing the expectation. Oh, <coughs> yeah. There, we have some guarantees as well on the expectation. Uh, this, this is something. Yeah, this is something we are working on. For regarding the population, then we, uh, to prove this guarantee is uh, something we are working on. But uh, in practice, everything, like how can we do uh, expectation? Then we have to do sample average, right? Just uh, regarding the implementation, everything is uh, like a discrete sample average, right? So for the theoretical guarantee, this is something we are working on. We don't know what's the convergence rate yet. First, we don't know convergence rate. Second is we don't know what's the optimal rate uh, scheduling. These two things are theoretical things we are studying right now. Later we will mention this again. Okay. So the second part of my talk is uh, momentum in neural architectural design. Okay. First, uh, we look at the residual network. Okay. This uh, residual network uh, today basically contains three stages. Okay. The, the after the first stage, there is a dimension reduction. After the second stage, there is another dimension reduction. And then residual, uh, basic residual network is uh, uh, formed with this residual units. Okay. Residual units is xk plus 1 equal to xk plus fxkwk. Wk is the parameter we are going to learn. Now, if we look at this carefully, we might ask, uh, how about uh, we change uh, Plus to minus. Okay. Will this change things? Second is if we have a parameter minus u minus mu here, right? We just slightly modify the residual network. We we have some testing. This doesn't matter. Okay. Just uh, do one step. Then how about what if we let's see similar as momentum? Okay. Similar as momentum. We first uh, change this to minus mu. Next uh, we do some extrapolation. Okay. Then this will help us to develop a principle in neural network, okay. or mathematically mechanistic, I would say. Right. So this is people who is doing those uh, mathematically based physics models, they would see that a mathematical mechanistic. Okay. To verify uh, the gradient descent analog makes sense, then we just uh, plot this, uh, the, the norm of the features after each block. Then after each block, for instance, we use uh, one, around 100 layer neural network. Then we plot this. After the first stage, you see this decays. Then second stage decays. Third stage decays. Because in gradient descent, we have a result is that if it converge, then the gradient norm should converge to zero, right? To make this analog, at least we should think this whether the analog makes sense or not, right? Residual. Then we check the re residual mapping should it become smaller and smaller. Yes. After training, after training, then we just uh, look at the, the testing data and the training data, just uh, the, the, the magnitude of the feature maps. Okay. Just uh, extract this and plot it. Then, next, uh, this will help us to design this network, which is extremely simple. On top of the original REST net, we just uh, have another, another data flow. This data flow is generated with, from the previous flow, and uh, then this uh, just uh, aggregated to here. Okay. It's extremely simple. Then we look at uh, this. We would say, for the same layer of depth of neural network, we should train it much faster, right? Training faster. Then actually, this is exactly we train faster. Because momentum, uh, if we incorporate this momentum in neural architectural design, then we would, uh, we would expect this will be much faster when we use the same SGD algorithm to train it, right? So then. We are also working on the accuracy. So far, the accuracy improvement is not that much yet. We are still working on this. But uh, again, we, we need to emphasize that we should not report any false discovery. Right? False discovery is just, uh, I look at Kevin Hayes' paper. He reported something like 93.63, but actually benchmark is 94.75. Okay. So we are still working on this. We, I believe we will have some better results in these two days. Okay. Then, perhaps, uh, People will talk about neural ODE type of things, right? Then this is a neural ODE. Our design is actually just a second order neural ODE. Okay. But uh, uh, I personally am not a big fan of neural ODE because uh, different reasons. Okay. So then this uh, actually is another way to to design second order neural ODE. Okay. 
this uh, perhaps can help to interpret some physical data. So that, that's uh, basically some of my talk, some concrete results. As a future direction, as we just mentioned, what's the optimal restart scheduling? Okay. Second is uh, how to generalize this schedule restart to adaptive step size. We tried this, but failed at this stage. Like, uh, we changed the momentum in Adam to this schedule restart uh, momentum. So far, we are not successful yet. Uh, but after ICML deadline, we will work, uh, look uh, detail into this. Also, this uh, we said we developed this momentum units. How can we do this neural architecture search for this momentum uh, with this momen momentum unit? Okay. Because today we have a lot of computing power, so we can even do this neural architecture search. It's not a big deal for us. Also, we mentioned, uh, let's see, if the problem is not, a, not a empirical risk minimization, it's just a long convex optimization, right? Because this uh, workshop, uh, the main theme is this medical image. Then I will not direct talk about a medical image, but I will talk about another even more fundamental imaging, like uh, Quell Yang, because today we do uh, target therapy. Target therapy, first we need to identify what's the protein structure. Quell Yang is, uh, is a very fundamental experimental to, uh, protocol for those, uh, uh, to find the 3D structure of protein. Then, one, uh, one of the most important part of cryo-EM is to reconstruct the, the protein structure, 3D structure. Then a common approach is called Relyon. Relyon is a very famous software. Then the, the basis to basic likelihood framework for cryo-EM structure def uh, determination by solving this uh, long convex optimization problem. And then uh, just uh, Two years, uh, two, uh, three years ago, there is a breakthrough in this area published uh, in Nature Methods. Okay, some computer scientists have published a paper here, which I think is uh, extremely difficult. Nature Methods, uh, some method has to be well recognized by those experimentalists, uh, and then you can publish a paper here. And then, basically, they just use the SGD. They found that uh, they have uh, they interpret uh, objective curve and then find each structure. Lots of local minima. This local minima contains this structure. This structure is uh, basically is nothing, right? You cannot find any, any interesting uh, thing here. But uh, if uh, we find a better minima, okay, then this protein, this structure looks much better, right? And then we can do this uh, secondary structure fitting to get the protein structure, okay? Then, okay, so here uh, they use SGD. Then how about we do this schedule restart SGD? Since certainly, I expect things uh, will improve much more. Okay, I'm optimistic about this. <coughs> then also, oh, as a summary, today I talk about the following thing: schedule restart, uh, less of accelerated momentum in stochastic gradient descent. So it uh, accelerates conversions, also better generaliz uh, generalizability. Then we have momentum in neural architectural design, so it can speed up training, so better generalization accuracy, and uh, also it, it's a mathematically principled approach. Okay. So I, I like this. I don't like ad hoc approach. Okay. So also we need to have better understanding in order to develop things. Okay. So this is uh, oh, there are two uh, preprints, not released yet. We will release these two papers uh, in a few days. Both are joined with uh, rice uh, rice contributors and then my personal mentor, in part, uh, Andrew Batuzzi and uh, Stan Osher. Uh, Stan is the guy who provided uh, basic ideas. Okay. So thank you. Thank you.